This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Good evening, everybody. Why don't we get started? Uh, my name is Sean Lin. I'm the, I, I direct the glaucoma service here at UCSF. There's our, our Corette Vision Center just down the, down the hill over there. And um, well, my focus today, I know we have a whole series on ophthalmology for you in the, in the mini medical school, but I'm gonna focus on glaucoma. And, but I'll give you a kind of a bird's eye view of eye diseases. Um, this is important for all of us, even if, you're, even if you're somebody who doesn't have eye disease. If we're planning to end getting older, which I am, uh, then we're gonna get one or more of these diseases. Uh, you had a great talk, I think, last week from one of my colleagues on cataract. We're all gonna get cataract, I hate to tell you this, but it's just our lens, our own lens inside our eye that grows more yellow and white over time and we don't see well and so most of us, if not almost all of us, are gonna get cataract surgery. Glaucoma, a fair percentage of us are gonna get. It's a blinding disease, it's the second leading cause of blindness in the US. Uh, and then the biggest, other biggest category is retinal disease which includes macular degeneration, the number one cause of irreversible blindness in the US and diabetic retinopathy which can happen at any age because diabetes can happen in the very young, in the, very, in the older population, and is increasing in incidence in the United States. So let me give you a little bit of ocular anatomy 101. Again, it'll relate to glaucoma as you'll see. So this is the front of the eye. Here's the back of the eye, and I'm gonna give you sort of the, the simplistic view of what glaucoma is. You know, fluid is made here in the front part of the eye, and then it has to go out. And this is basically a ball. It's an enclosed ball, and the pressure is too high. That's generally what glaucoma is, and it damages the nerve. The way I s explain it simply to my patients is when the pressure is too high, it's like you stuck a thumb right here at the optic nerve, and you made that cup, that indentation, bigger. You're destroying the optic nerve slowly. I've told you a little bit about a cataract already. It's our lens. We all have a lens. If you don't, you've already had cataract surgery and you have a, a plastic lens in. When we're young and we're like 20 years old, it's a nice crystalline lens, like a magnifying lens that you would hold up. But unfortunately, as we get older, it turns more and more yellow or more white, and it's harder for us to see through that. So chances are, we're all gonna have, most of us are gonna need cataract surgery. This is somebody who's dilated. You can see this is an extreme cataract. Imagine that's a window and you're trying to look through it. You can't see very well, so the patient can't see very well out. And what cataracts do is they generally decrease your vision over time. So everything sort of gets blurry. And, and the number one cause of vision getting blurry for, for us older folks is that you know, you're, you're developing a cataract. Uh, what are ways to help prevent it? Well, probably one of the best ways is to wear sunglasses. It's been well established in animal models, human models as well, that ultraviolet radiation damage to your lens over time will cause cataracts. So people, for example, in India, who are 90% usually out working out in the fields, uh, they have very high rates of cataracts and they also have very severe cataracts when they do develop it. Cataract surgery is relatively simple. I'm giving you sort of a summary of what you had last week, which is you take out the lens, with ultrasound, you make a little incision, use, a, use an instrument that looks like a pen, and then you ultrasound out the, uh, the inside of the lens, and then you put a new plastic lens in. So it's a treatable disease. It's great to do this surgery. I will tell you a little bit of a sideline here that's related to my ultimate talk, which is that in most people who have cataract surgery, the pressure goes down, sometimes substantially, and it's often used as a sort of a mini glaucoma surgery. And the lens is supposed to stay in its place and then focus light, and you're supposed to see, you know, 2020 again if everything else is okay with your eyes. Again, back to ocular anatomy 101, just to, as the introduction of glaucoma, is that 
Uh, the fluid is made here at the ciliary body, which is behind the iris. It goes in front of the pupil and then goes out through this area we call the angle. I'll tell you more about it and we'll see a little magnification of it. But just wanted to remind you that's where the plumbing of the eye is. That's where the going in and going out for the fluid is. And to give you a little bit of the epidemiology, that is, how, how big a disease is this? And, and, you know, when I tell patients they have glaucoma, oh my God, you know, it's, you know, I got this rare disease. It's not all that rare, to be honest. It's the leading cause of irreversible blindness worldwide. And when I say irreversible blindness, what I'm saying is that, you know, if you take out cataract. So the number one cause of blindness in the world is cataract, but it's treatable. Unfortunately, with glaucoma, when it causes you to go blind, you can't reverse the disease. So it's better to catch it early, right? Rather than wait till you have atrophy of your optic nerve and you can't see well, I can't bring that back. I can only help to prevent that from getting worse or hopefully prevent the disease completely. Uh, in the U.S., it's the second leading cause of blindness. I mentioned that macular degeneration uh, is the leading cause of blindness. And that has a lot to do with race. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But there are a lot of racial differences in macular degeneration and, uh, and glaucoma. And there's two main categories of glaucoma. There's open angle glaucoma, which is most of the glaucoma in the world. And there's also closed angle glaucoma, which is a more of a minority, but it's also a more devastating disease, particularly in Asia. It's very common. And so being a more aggressive disease, it's more likely to lead to, to blindness. I was telling you about the racial differences, huge racial differences in glaucoma. For example, African Americans get four to five times more glaucoma than whites. Not a little bit more, 10% more, but four times more. So the difference is about 10%, basically one in 10 African Americans will develop glaucoma versus whites where it's about two and a half percent. Even at two and a half percent for the medical industry, that's huge. You know, it's not one in 10,000 or one in 30,000. This is, this means that, you know, if you kind of walk out in the street and you meet a hundred people, probably about two or three of them will develop glaucoma. And again, among African Americans, that's one in 10. Hispanics are somewhere in between, about five to 6%, according to the Latino study that was done in Los Angeles. Asians have more of a variety, you know, in terms of, uh, and it's somewhere between two and 5% looking at the studies from Asia. Chinese have a large amount of the closed angle or glaucoma that I was telling you about. And in Japanese and Koreans, they mostly have this normal tension type. Here I've told you that glaucoma, basically high pressure equals glaucoma. Well, the truth is it's not all high pressure. I'm simplifying it for you. The only thing we can treat, unfortunately, is the pressure. But about 25% of the glaucoma in the United States is where it's in that normal range. And in Japanese and Koreans, it's almost all their glaucoma is in that normal range of pressure. It's kind of like developing a stroke when in fact your blood pressure is low. And, in, and you know that, that blood pressure is your highest risk factor for getting a stroke. So as I said, you know, this is my simple way for describing it to patients. I think it's an easy way to remember it is that, you know, in the normal eye, your optic nerve, which inserts in the back, you know, and carries the information back to your brain and tells you what you see. That's the structure that gets damaged. That's really where the disease is in terms of what makes you go blind. And this is a magnification of that. So you can tell there's, there's, there's these fascicles. They, they're carrying the axons, the nervous uh, uh, tissue fibers that are going back to your brain. And what happens in glaucoma is that pressure, again, it's like sticking a thumb right into your optic nerve here, and it gets cupped. So you'll hear your doctor is talking about, well, your cup to disc ratio, what, you know, what that, uh, this, the whole disc is the whole round circle itself. And all, most of us have a little bit of a cup, a little indentation where the blood vessels go through. But again, glaucoma is like sticking a thumb right into that uh, optic nerve and creating this indentation and loss of tissue. And so we talk about it in terms of describing the optic nerve in terms of cut to disc ratio. Glaucoma is a little bit sneakier. Remember that picture where I said that in cataracts, as we start getting cataracts, it's, everything kind of gets fuzzy. I and mean, when light gets shown in your eye, you get glare. And so your vision just gets poor in general, and you realize, I gotta go and see somebody because I don't see as well, or my glasses aren't working as well. Well, glaucoma is a sneaky disease. It damages vision in the majority of cases in your periphery. And what that means is, okay, and maybe some of you or most of you have done a visual field test, and we have you sit in front of this big bowl, right? And you hit a button every time the light flashes inside there. It steals your vision out here, and it kind of creeps, and it can start somewhere else. And only in the end does your central vision go in the vast majority of cases. And why is that sneaky? Because most of us don't know, don't 
can't tell. So if one of my eyes has this area that I can't see very well, well, I don't usually use this part of my vision, but if I'm talking to you and I'm looking straight at your face, that central part of my vision, if I can't see well and there's a smudge there, I'm going to know to go to my ophthalmologist or my optometrist. Something's wrong. And that's what macular degeneration does. So that's not a sneaky disease. It's right in the middle of your vision. But this is a very sneaky disease that requires, you know, good vigilance in order to detect it or detect it's getting worse. And of course, your other eye compensates too. So if you have one eye worse than the other, your other eye is compensating for the visual field in the world. What about the, uh, the anatomy of glaucoma? So what's the problem that causes this pressure to go up? You know, that's the, that's the question I get as a, as a doctor all the time. Okay, well, how did I get this disease? Why is my pressure high? You know, why isn't the next person's pressure high? Well, here's the, here's the business end, and I'm not going to really tell you the answer, because I don't know the answer. I'm just going to tell you what the problem is. Well, the fluid is made here. This is kind of a blow-up of the front part of your eye that I was telling you about. Fluid is made behind the iris by the ciliary body. It's a filtration of your blood. You know, you need that because you need some nutrients to go into your eye and give nutrition to your eye. And then it goes out through this area in front of the iris. It's still within your eye. The cornea is here, but we call this an angle. So you talk, you know, you hear me talking about an open angle and a closed angle. Well, this is, this is an angle. It's open. Uh, fluid it has access to where it needs to go to go back into the, the trabecular meshwork is that meshwork of tissue where it filters through. And then this looks like a round blood vessel, which it is. So it's going back into your blood. And so there's some dysfunction with that system in glaucoma. And, and it was discovered decades ago that the problem is not that you're making too much fluid, but that the drain is clogged. And so fluid can't get out very well, and the pressure goes high. So if you pumped up a basketball and there's no fluid, you know, no way for that air to go out, what's going to happen to that basketball? It's going to get really rock hard. Uh, and the open angle situation is where the angle, when the doctor looks at it, or we get a snapshot of it, it looks open. And that's the majority of glaucoma. So if any of you have glaucoma, that's most likely what you have, an open angle type of glaucoma. The closed angle type of glaucoma, I think I have, do I have an image of that? Yeah, the closed angle glaucoma, now I've flipped the eye the other way, by the way. Here's the front of the eye and here's the angle. So this is where it's showing you that it's, it's open. Well, in closed angle glaucoma, the iris is coming up and that angle is closed up. So it physically is, is you know, it's like you actually took the, the drain and you, you, you squeezed it shut. And so it's not being able to get out. And again, Chinese have more of this. And we'll talk about, and Asians have more of this. And we'll talk about why that is in the, toward the end here. And I want to show you a little video about how dynamic this process is. This is actually uh, an ultrasound, a live sort of, you know, ultrasound of what's going on. You can tell this angle is closed up when I turn off the lights. And when I turn on the lights, it opens up. So it's a very dynamic process. Doctors, myself included, are supposed to know that you know, you're supposed to look for this, and you're supposed to do it under dark conditions to see when you know, m most maximally it could close up and uh, detect this type of glaucoma. Here's somebody that I don't even have to turn on and off the lights. You can tell this angle is, is, is closed up. It should be open all the way into here. And the iris is pooched up, puff, puffed up into this area and closing off the outflow and the pressure uh, can go high in the future, especially if it chronically stays closed like that. And what the treatment for this is, by the way, and maybe some of you have had this, is what we call a laser iridotomy. You go in there and we do a laser, make a little laser hole in your peripheral iris, and all of that iris that gets pooched up, well, that fluid can go through. It's like a little bypass, and then everything falls back. And this is that same patient. Now you can tell the iris is, uh, or the iris has fallen back into a straight line, and I'm actually doing ultrasound right in that area that I made a, a laser hole. You so you see the opening, the communication between the back part of the uh, iris and the front of the iris, and the angle is opened up. So in fact, this is a, a preventative procedure, kind of like a preventative treatment for you know open angle glaucoma by making your pressure go down before you actually go get glaucoma. So this would be one of the ways to help prevent. Uh, closed angle glaucoma worldwide is a simple laser procedure. So how do we diagnose glaucoma? You know, I've told you a lot of the elements already, but what are some of the actual tests that when you actually walk into an ophthalmologist's office that you're going to get? Well, you know, I told you it's a pressure problem in the beginning. That's what we're going to check. For those of you who have been to an optometrist, that check is often an air puff test. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just not very accurate. So if you go to an ophthalmologist's office, the difference being an ophthalmologist is MD and treating your disease and wants to know precisely what your pressure is and how you're doing in terms of the medical treatment. Uh, we usually use a test I'll show you in a minute. But the air puff test is basically a good screening test without actually having to touch your eye. 
Then we also look at your optic nerve. We get the visual field test to see if you've lost any peripheral vision. And the gonioscopy test is looking at the angle, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a minute. So the eye pressure test that ophthalmologists like, this is the gold standard. Um, you put your head up, uh, up to the slit lab, and then an actual probe comes to your eye. It's completely mechanical, developed by Hans Goldmann in Switzerland decades ago. Uh, after a drop is put in your eye, this, this probe actually touches your eye and counterbalances the pressure in your eye. So if you have a rock hard eye, the doctor has to dial in a little bit more pressure to counterbalance that pressure in your eye and, me and reads it mechanically. Surprisingly, it's a very accurate test. It's a little bit like when you go to your primary care doctor and they wrap that blood pressure cuff around you, pump it up, and then listen with a stethoscope. Seems archaic, but actually it, it, it tests very well compared to the, the, um, the digital test. Then we look at your optic nerve. So even if you go to an optometrist, hopefully they're doing this as well. They're testing your pressure, maybe with an air puff test. They're looking inside your, your eye and seeing if your optic nerve looks like this which is nice and healthy looking, you know, nice healthy tissue in the middle, almost no cup here. And then this optic nerve, you can tell that that pale, that pallor in the middle is telling you that's the cup. And this person has early glaucoma, and this is the optic nerve blown up in, in scale a little bit. And you can tell this optic nerve is almost completely pale. The cup is almost the entire optic nerve. And this person has almost no tissue left. So that's what the doctor sees or what the doctor gets pictures of. And then the visual field test, Again, normal result, this is an automated one, so you see all these little dots representing, that's where it tested you and you were supposed to hit a button even if you, you know, even if it was a very faint light, that tells us that you actually saw that area to the extent that the machine says is normal for your age category. This is somebody with glaucoma where this darkening is an area that they didn't see. They didn't hit the button in that area. And the darker it is, that means that they showed the, the machine showed a very bright light and you still couldn't see it. Gray is obviously somewhere in between. And usually what happens in glaucoma is it spreads from there. You can have another start area and then it can spread from there, but it usually isn't like one spot here, one spot there, and one spot completely, uh, you know, in another area there. I need to probably tell you something that's very important, you know, as we're talking about some of these tests. Just this test being normal does not mean you don't have glaucoma because God gave us more tissue than we need. So you can have the beginning of glaucoma, say your pressure's high, say your pressure's 25, the normal's between 10 and 21. If your pressure's 25 and you have glaucoma, you may go years where the nerve gets damaged, but God gave us more nerve tissue than we need. So you would actually have to have 40% or almost half that nerve damaged before it shows up as visual field loss. That's good and bad. I'm glad God gave, gave me sort of extra cushion of tissue. But unfortunately, that does not mean that just because your visual field is normal, you don't have glaucoma. We'd like to catch it at that stage before you actually lose vision and, uh, and treat you then. Gonioscopy is a little more specialized, although every ophthalmologist is supposed to do this in all of their patients with a, with a suspicion or having glaucoma, is dis distinguished between the two types. I can guarantee you there's a lot of cases where maybe the doctor doesn't do this and has been treating glaucoma maybe, but thinking it was open angle when in fact it might have been closed angle and some of the treatment modalities might have been different, including doing that laser that I was telling you about. Or catching that before you actually get glaucoma and doing the laser would be nice as well. So there are imaging modalities besides the doctor having to do this. Why doesn't the doctor do this all the time? Well, not blaming anybody. Uh, this, is, this is an uncomfortable test. For those of you who've gotten an eye exam before, you know, really for glaucoma or you have glaucoma, what they do is we put an anesthetic drop in your eye and we take this lens, this fancy lens out of our pocket and put it on your eye and you're squinting because you don't want a lens on your eye and they're kind of struggling to see what they see. So it's a difficult test. And so I, I've been, always been a proponent for doing some of the imaging and you saw some of it already, that ultrasound where things were actually moving. That's a nice kind of test to look for this as well. And then I promised to talk about the normal tension type. It used to be thought that this was a rare type of disease, right? If you asked ophthalmologists 30 years ago, what was glaucoma? High pressure equals glaucoma. That's our simplistic way, and there's nothing wrong with that. We just didn't have enough information. But as we realized that, you know, glaucoma can happen even, even in patients with a normal pressure range. I'm particularly pointing out that it's Japanese because uh, among Japanese, that's the major form of their glaucoma. How is that important for, for any of you, even if you're not Japanese? Well, just because your pressure is normal doesn't mean you don't have glaucoma. And so therefore, if you go get a checkup, it's not just, I mean, if it was that simple, then we'd have you know, glaucoma screening throughout you know, malls. Somebody could just check your pressure. We can 
We can teach a technician, we can teach a high school student to take your pressure, but that doesn't mean that you don't have glaucoma. That's why that doesn't exist, that you see that in malls. Uh, you really have to have a doctor, somebody experienced, look at your optic nerve, or at least maybe get these fancy tests that actually image the optic nerve as well. And so now that's more equipment and that's more you know, uh, expertise that has to go into reading that. But there is such a thing and it's not, a, it's not an uncommon uh, aspect in the United States, as I said, maybe about a quarter of the people in the United States have this form that is the low tension type. Let's talk a little bit about the treatments for glaucoma. So, I told you that you know in the beginning you can simplify it as high pressure causes glaucoma or causes uh, you know damage your optic nerve and hope you know possibly blindness later on. And, and even in normal tension glaucoma, it's still about the pressure because a study has shown the collaborative normal tension glaucoma study, a big study that randomized people to uh, if you had normal tension glaucoma, you would either go into the category that didn't get treated or you would go into the category that got treated because. Back 30 years ago when this study was conducted, we didn't even know in those kind of cases whether treatment was useful or not, right? The pressure was normal in the beginning. Well, the bottom line of that study was yes, it was beneficial to actually treat normal tension glaucoma. You would rather have been in that category that got treated than in the category that didn't get treated, in which that, those people got worse at a faster rate. So the only thing that we have, the only thing that I have if somebody comes into my office to treat you is to lower your eye pressure. So just think about that. I mean, everything I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you about surgery, I'm going to tell you about lasers and all these medications, but all of them are aimed at the same thing, is to get your eye pressure down. I wish I had something that could actually protect your optic nerve, like a pill you could take that could, you know, maybe your pressure is high, but I can't get it down. Well, here's a pill that will keep your nerve from getting worse, but I don't have that, unfortunately. And that's the last line there, which is neuroprotection is what we call it. It's not just my field. It's the field of stroke, it's the field of you know, Alzheimer's as well as Parkinson's. In fact, we borrowed one of those drugs from those fields in order to study to see if it would uh, be useful in glaucoma. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Unfortunately, that drug didn't work, but it's the same thing. It's trying to protect your nervous tissue in your, in your brain and the same nervous tissue is going on in your eye and trying to protect that from degenerating. So again, back to what we're able to do, what's approved for us to do, is to lower your eye pressure by these various drugs, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to tell you go into detail because these are the scientific names of the drugs, but what they do basically is two things. So it's a plumbing problem. Let's go back to the plumbing paradigm, which is that fluid is made here behind the iris, goes in front of the people and goes out. So I have only two things that you can do. Either decrease the amount of fluid that's getting into your eye, you know, through the drug, or increase the fluid getting out. So these are drugs that decrease the inflow and these are drugs that increase the outflow. Simple plumbing in some ways, but just different ways of getting at the same thing. What are some of the drugs? Well, I'm giving you the number one agent in each category, so to speak. Zalatan, which has now gone generic, latanoprost, as you see there, is the prostaglandin drug. And prostaglandins are in our body, in all of us, you know, in, all, in practically all of our systems. And prostaglandins are involved in inflammation, so if we were to get punched or something, our muscles probably would start producing prostaglandins as a, as a reaction to the inflammation that's going on. So what does this have to do with glaucoma? Well, these drugs, these, these things that our body already makes by itself, if you use it at a high concentration in your eye, it lowers the eye pressure. It's actually the best drug out there for lowering eye pressure. It's a best-selling medication, now it's gone generic. It's also the best-selling medication because not only does it work the best, it's once a day, which is great. Hopefully some drugs are even trying to say that you can do it every other day. Minimal side effects, it really doesn't affect your systemic you know, body in any way, but it has very curious eye side effects. This is what I tell my patients, and I think you'll be very interested in these cosmetic side effects. Well, I tell them that it can make your iris color darker. If they happen to be Chinese, Hispanic, or African American, I tell them, you're like me, you know, the color of my iris is already dark, it's not gonna get any darker, that won't affect you. It can make, make the skin around your eye darker, so I guess an extreme case would be maybe walking around looking like a panda bear or a raccoon. Um, <laughs> probably we wouldn't wait till you look like that before we stop the drug. And then the third one is very curious, and actually women will particularly pay attention to it. It makes your eyelashes grow longer. And in fact, one of the companies called Allergan has uh, patented that pa aspect and, and marketed it for it, and probably will make more money off of that. It's called the <laughs> Latisse, by the way. You know, because, and they're the, they're the company that makes uh, Botox, by the way. They're an eye company, and Botox was used actually for the eyes first. So that's why it's an eye company that owns Botox. Timolol used to be number one. It's a beta blocker. For those of you who know a little bit about blood pressure, beta blockers lower your blood pressure. But in the eye, they, they have a different function. They actually decrease the amount of fluid that's made, so it shuts down the faucet. 
a little bit. So it lowers the eye pressure. Used to be the best one until, you know, the latanoprost of the world came along. And uh, unfortunately, they have the side effects of beta blockers. So they get into your, your you know, muc through your mucous membranes, into your blood re relatively rapidly. So these are all the contraindications. If you have asthma, if you have severe heart disease or heart block, if you have depression, for men, erectile dysfunction, it worsens that. Uh, it doesn't have much side effects against the eye, thankfully. So it's still used. It's a number two drug now. It's dropped to number two. Number three um, is, is this is the company name for it, Alphagan or Bramonidine, Purple Top. And it, it's twice a day. It works pretty well as well. And probably the reason it's not close to being number one is the last line there, which is it has a substantial side of uh, allergy profile, which means about one in seven people will develop an allergy to it. For people in medicine, that's a very high number. We, we don't want one in seven of our patients develop an allergy. You have to stop it, come in for an acute visit or something. TruSopt, or this is the company name again, but these are carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. These are sort of fourth line. They're diuretics, but in the eye, when you use it, it won't make you go pee more or anything like that. Um, it doesn't get in the blood enough to do that. But it also decreases the amount of production of fluid in your eye. Um, it doesn't work as well, so that's why it's down to fourth. Number two is that it's used twice a day or three times a day. And maybe number three, and maybe a very important reason, is it burns a lot. So when you put it in, it stings a lot. Some of my patients actually think maybe that's a good aspect because they know they got it in. One of the hardest things is to get the eye drop in your eye. Believe me, it's, uh, it's not, it's not um, insignificant. Um, I'll give you a little story. One of my colleagues at Johns Hopkins studied this, and he had his patients coming in, sign a little form saying, let us, uh, you know, we're doing this study. Show us how you put your drops in. And so he got all sorts of, and he would videotape them. He got all sorts of different ways, you know. And, and half the time they wouldn't get it in right, even with the doctor watching. Sometimes it hit here, it hit here, it hit here, you know. And the funniest one was at the end where he said, Mrs. Smith, show me how you put your drop in. She takes it, she opens it up, she opens her mouth and puts a drop in. <laughs> um, that doesn't work too well for glaucoma, unfortunately. Um, Pilocarpine is the first drug that was ever developed for glaucoma. It's still around. I still use it occasionally, but it's really getting to be very unpopular. Four times a day dosing because it has such a short half-life. It has terrible side effects, makes your pupil small, so you actually get less light in there. You don't see as good. So actually, patients think you're making them go blind, actually. And it uh, causes a headache as well, so you can imagine why. We talked about neuroprotection a little bit. I wish we had a neuroprotective drug. This is the new frontier. Allergan, that same company that I told you makes Botox and, and is gonna, has patented that drug for making your eyelashes grow longer. Well, they spent $100 million on this drug that's already used for Alzheimer's and for Parkinson's. And I was, one, I was the principal investigator for UCSF, you know, recruiting it for here. And, and they got thousands of patients you know, for this study across the, uh, across the globe. And unfortunately, after five years of following these patients to see if their visual fields would get worse and their optic nerves would get worse, it didn't work. Compared to placebo, it didn't work. I wish it did because then, you know, for all my glaucoma patients, if I can't control their pressure well enough, maybe we don't have to go to surgery. Maybe I can give you this drug that will protect your optic nerve. I'm hoping that we'll get something else similar to this that, that would actually work, first of all. But I'm a little bit worried that, that if you look at from a drug company's you know, portfolio point of view and from their financial point of view, they've already had one drug, they've already seen one drug lose a million, half of, you know, $100 million. Why would they want to invest $100 million into something that may not work, that goes along for over five years? Why not invest in a drug that's just an eye drop? All you have to do is show that it works in one year. Because all you have to do is show that the pressure goes down. And so I'm a little afraid that we may not get the neuroprotection for glaucoma in the future because of, unfortunately, this failure. Again, this drug is called Mementine. We were one of the sites for it. Over thousands of patients. It had to be over so many years because you're studying something that is a slow disease. So if I didn't mention this in the beginning, glaucoma doesn't usually make you go blind right away or even in a month, unless you have an attack of glaucoma, particularly closed angle glaucoma, which can be an attack. But the general form of glaucoma is usually one where, again, if you don't go in, to the eye doctor, you may not even know you're, you're, you have it and you're slowly going blind. But even if you know you have it and you're getting treated, it's a slow disease. You know, that high pressure is slowly causing you to lo lose more nerve tissue over time. And it's usually many years or decades before you, you know, lose substantial vision. So we talked about the drugs. What's the next stage or what's another maybe less invasive stage uh, short of surgery? Well. You can do laser trabeculoplasty. That's a fancy way of saying we're going to laser the area where the fluid goes out of the eye. So here's that blow up of the front of your eye, and this is where the fluid goes out. It was discovered in monkeys where they're actually trying to develop a 
you know, glaucoma on these monkeys, and it's still the standard uh, monkey model for glaucoma, which is you over laser, you, you hyper laser this area and close off that area by causing it to scar. Well, when these doctors were doing those experiments in monkeys decades ago, they realized, wow, the laser wasn't working very well, so they actually undertreated this area, treated only about 10% of the energy that was needed. And what did they find? They found that pressure went down. So they didn't cause too much scarring, but they actually tickled the area, and we don't know the exact mechanism. We think that cytokines, these molecules get released, and they make those, that area function better. But lo and behold, it makes the pressure go down, and so this is a very common treatment. Some glaucoma specialists will actually um, recommend this as the first-line treatment for their patients. I'm sort of in the middle. You know, most doctors will have patients use drops because it's just so much easier and it's so much more accepted. You know, if you went into your eye doctor for the first time and you got told you had glaucoma and they start telling you about, well, you have to use this eye drop every night and, you know, come back and see me, that you're more likely to accept than, oh, you have glaucoma, I've got to take you to laser. And that sounds like surgery and that sounds like something I could go blind from. So it's, it's partly for those reasons. But the truth is it's a very safe procedure. I mean, it, in terms of side effects or, you know, it's, it's practically zero chance it's going to cause any, any harm in you. So why do we use it all the time? Why is there only about 10% of doctors who push this as the first line? It doesn't work very well. It's kind of like the effect of one weak eye drop. So I was telling you about the first line eye drop, lowers your pressure about 30%. This one lowers it about 20% if you're lucky. And then what's the other reason? Well, it, it doesn't last very long. So after one year, probably about a quarter of those patients, maybe more, their pressures are starting to go up or have gone up. And then you, you can do it again. You can't do it forever, maybe two or three times. And so that's another reason, too, is it doesn't have a long-lasting effect. Now we're going to go into the big guns here. We're going to talk about surgery. And I will tell you that unlike cataract surgery, which you, for some of you who came here last week and heard my colleague talk about cataract surgery, that's pretty straightforward unless you really have a complication, which is uncommon. You know, vast majority of cataract surgeries, patient does well, they see better, they're happy, the doctor's happy, you know, and you have, usually have very low chance for complications. With glaucoma surgeries, unfortunately, it's not that the surgeons are bad, it's the nature of what we're doing, and I'm gonna explain it to you, but we're making a hole in your eye. We're putting a drain in your eye, and it's doing something that God didn't intend, and intend to stay there, that is this complete you know, continual drainage of fluid out of your eye, that it makes this so hard. And I'm hoping, you know, unfortunately I've been in this field as a professor for 15 years. You know, I used to say, God, 10 years from now, I'm not gonna be doing this surgery anymore. We're gonna have something fantastic. We're gonna be injecting something into the eye that will reverse the disease, we'll have gene therapy. No, we don't have that. And I, I worry that 10 years from now or 15 years from now, this is still the main surgery that's gonna be done, which is basically making a hole in your eye. That's basically how I would describe it. I mean, I know that there's more things going on than just making a hole. This is a flap of tissue. Here's the skin of your eye, which you have to reflect back. This is the front of the eye here. And then you make a flap of tissue. And the reason you make a flap is you don't want just a hole in the eye. The old way was to actually literally make a hole in your eye. You make the hole underneath the flap, and then you put that flap back and you sew it, and you watch how much it leaks. So you want it to leak at a certain rate. This is called the trabeculectomy. It means that you're taking out some of the trabecular meshwork that I was telling you about. Unfortunately, the bottom line is it's a hole in the eye. And then that fluid accumulates under the skin of the eye, and it's supposed to be a little bubble, a little bleb, a little blister. And again, that's not something God intended to. The biggest failure from this is because your body wants to scar down and close everything off so that fluid can't get out again. That's really the biggest side effect of the surgery. But other side effects include the pressure's too low in the beginning. Other side effects include you have a lifelong chance for infection. It's not insignificant. It could be a 10% chance overall. And when I'm talking about infection, I'm talking about possibly going blind because that's, that's serious. Is that the sclera that's being flipped up? Yeah, this part here? Yeah. That's a good question, yeah. And so this, it's, it's not the entire sclera, it's a, it's a partial thickness, half thickness of the sclera, because we're creating a flap with your own tissue. And so we want to be able to cover up that hole that you see us incising there, and then we'll cover it up and we'll see how much it leaks. Again, in the old days, they just punch a hole directly through, but that had a lot of complications associated with it. So what's an alternative? This is an alternative. I'm not gonna show you all the alternatives. There's, uh, there's probably at least 10 other ways you can you know, lower the eye pressure. Most of them are not similar to this because you know, the companies that are out there, the venture capital companies, they're trying to get away from these surgeries that have all these complications, that do so much surgery, have infection risks. But this is, again, very similar to the other one. 
uh, where you put a tube in the eye. Again, a plumber, right? I, as some of my colleagues say, we're just glorified plumbers or overpaid plumbers because we're just putting in, we're making a hole or we're putting a drain in your eye so that the fluid, so here's the drain inside, it would go out here, here's a piece of plastic that is sitting on top of your eye. And why is it there? Because when the fluid comes out, if you didn't have that plastic, well, all that tissue would just scar down and you wouldn't be able to drain anything. So the, the plastic acts as a spacer and then you put the skin over that and it will act as a space for all that fluid to go to and then hopefully get absorbed by the blood vessels. The Ahmed tube is just one of the more common tubes that are used. Now I'm gonna spend probably the last 20 minutes of the, the at least my session before we have questions. Talk a little bit about my research. Again, it, it will relate to many of you, and it has it's back to that idea of the diversity of glaucoma among these different races. And since we're in San Francisco, and 40% and of the city practically is Asians, I have a lot of access to different Asian groups and studying this. And also, I'll give you some of the data from, from overseas and Asia. But there's quite a range of, of glaucoma, and uh, quite a range of the glaucoma in Asians. So, of course, my population are Asian Americans. We'll talk about the mechanisms for angle closure. And uh, these are the Asian groups that I've studied thus far. Uh, of course, we have plenty of Chinese Americans in the city. We have a fair number of Japanese Americans, a large number of Filipinos. And, and actually, I had to go to San Jose with one of my colleagues to study her Vietnamese uh, American population there and see what kind of glaucoma that they get. One of my colleagues and uh, who trained at UCSF, Dr. Shu Kwok, is out in Chinatown. I think he was the first ophthalmologist out there. He was very interested in this topic already. So, you know, we had a lot of data just by looking through his charts. And so he picked out all the people who were glaucoma in his practice or who were suspects for glaucoma. And what we found was that over half of them were narrow or closed by gonioscopy. Gonio means that test that we did to look at the angle. And in fact, if you were 60 and older and had glaucoma, almost most of them were this narrow or closed angle types. And it happens in older age. If you're greater hyperopia, means you have a shorter eye. I have a long eye, by the way. You see my thick glasses, so I've got this really long eye that I have to compensate with these type of lenses. That means you're very nearsighted, right? So, so I have the opposite of this. But if you had the opposite of me with a short eye, you have more risk for it. And females are more at risk for this type of glaucoma. It's the, the, the difference is two to one. So, so women have a two, two-fold risk of developing this narrow angle glaucoma. Why is that? Women in general have smaller eyes. That's the basic reason. And so if you look at the white bars, the, the group that had very narrow angles, as you see with that 60 year old, 60 you know, and above jump, wow, that percentage that was the narrow angles jumps up quite a bit. It's, and the reason is, we'll sh I'll show you some of the reasons toward the end. But as we age, basically the lens gets bigger, that cataract gets bigger and it pushes that iris up more forward and you're getting more angle closure. We've done this study, it's a very interesting study I think, where we looked at Chinese Americans and of course I have Caucasians in my practice so we studied them and then I got together with two colleagues in, in, in China over in Beijing which is, represents northern Chinese and then in southern China with, uh, in Guangzhou or what is commonly known as Canton. So we had southern and northern Chinese, we had Chinese American, and we were wanting to know why Chinese have such a great disparity, because there's such a difference between them and whites in terms of their type of glaucoma. And, and so we wanted to see if there was regional differences too. I know Chinese all look alike, but we were, there are differences, or all Asians look alike, right? But there probably there might be differences. Well, unfortunately what we found, or not unfortunately, but what we found was actually that the eye structure was similar among all the different Chinese groups, among the Chinese Americans, Northern Chinese, Southern Chinese. They were all similar in terms of structure. So we ended up lumping all their data together and comparing to the whites, and there was quite a bit of difference. I think this will be interesting. Again, this may not relate directly to your glaucoma. By the way, we've done pilot studies in Chinatown as well, and that's also found that there's a lot of risk for closed angle glaucoma. Here's our eye van, and on a given weekend, we would go out there, because I only have time on weekends, and so there's me in the middle, and we had fellows and residents, all the way from high school students who were volunteering, technicians, you know, people, they were volunteering to do this on a weekend, and the patients would come to our eye van for eye exams, as we would use their community centers as well. And I'll tell you some of the results of, uh, you know, our comparative studies in a little bit. Japanese Americans, we've studied them as well, and uh, this is one of my fellows who, uh, accumulated all the data from my colleagues, Dr. Hirabayashi and Dr. Tanaka. Maybe some of you are patients of these two, two uh, friends of mine. And they're both, they're both uh, ophthalmologists in the city, and they both are Japanese, obviously, so they have a preponderance of Japanese patients who go to them. So we borrowed their patients. And that big 
bar or that big piece of the pie here is these are the number of people who are the percentage of people who had normal tension glaucoma. So you can tell if you're Japanese, if I check your pressure, it's almost meaningless, right? Even if you have a normal pressure, it doesn't mean you don't have glaucoma. The majority of glaucoma in Japanese is normal tension. But the truth is it also applies to all of you in this room. Even if you're white, about 25% of your glaucoma is normal tension glaucoma. That goes back to the idea that just testing the pressure is not a good enough test for glaucoma. How about Filipino Americans? There were no studies before we published some, some studies. This has already been published, and so we have two or three papers. But you know, nobody's really studied Filipinos. And, uh, and of course, in the Bay Area, in areas such as, uh, what is it, Daly City has about 40% Filipino. And then I have a colleague who's in Vallejo. Actually, this guy's in Vallejo, my colleague, my, my former resident who used to train here. And we borrowed his patients. We asked him to do all these certain tests in, in his subjects who were Filipino. And we found that about 31%, this is in one eye, and this is the group, you know, 55 and older, about a third of the patients had narrow angles or almost closed angles. So that, you know, just to generally, uh, if 100 patients came to them, about a third of them looked like they could be at risk for this type of angle closure glaucoma. Very similar to Chinese, a lot of this, you know, type of angle closure glaucoma. And we also borrowed patients from one of my former residents who's in Daly City. Again, almost half his patients are Filipino. And if you look at the black bars here, you can tell with increasing age, basically, you had a trend towards higher risk for looking like a uh, proportion of patients who had uh, narrow angles. This is just, your, your risk goes up over time for having that. Then we did a study where we combined all of their patients with glaucoma. This, is, this person's now done with his training. He trained at Stanford, but was a medical student with me. He is Filipino-American, so he was, he was very interested in this study. And we borrowed my patients from those two doctors we talked about. And we also compared it to whites. We needed some sort of reference group. And uh, we had over 1,000 patients in each group. We actually didn't even take all the patients. We randomly chose them so that we didn't have to go through all 10,000 patients or something. And then we found a higher rate overall of glaucoma among Filipinos than, say, whites, which doesn't surprise you, right? This is not, by the way, a population study, so these percentages don't mean the whole population has it, but just within that clinic, within those clinics. And the proportion that was angle closure glaucoma was higher. It's almost 0% in whites. That's what we found. And, and other studies have confirmed that, too. It's very uncommon among whites to have closed-angle glaucoma. It's not impossible, but it's just very uncommon. And in Filipinos, it was about 8% of their glaucoma. You could say, well, that seems pretty significant. We were actually a little disappointed. We thought maybe it would be close to Chinese. You know, it'd be like half of their, almost half of their glaucoma was angle closure. It was actually only a relatively small percent. But we, what we found that was new and that was interesting is that the proportion of glaucoma that was normal tension type that I told you is very common among Japanese, it was about half of the glaucoma in Filipinos. And in, in Caucasians, it was 27%. That makes sense to you, right? I've been telling you all along that, that even in whites, about one in four cases of glaucoma are ones where the pressure is normal to start off with. And so that's what we've confirmed. Vietnamese Americans, this is my doctor, my colleague over in San Jose, and there's a, uh, I think San Jose has the largest Vietnamese population outside of Vietnam, is what I've heard quoted. Um, and so she's Vietnamese, by the way, and she's glaucoma trained, so she does all the right tests in glaucoma, and we looked at her patients with glaucoma, and out of those, about half of them had the primary open angle glaucoma, the standard one where the angle is open. I'm going to read off these. Primary angle closure glaucoma is that type that I'm telling you is the closed angle glaucoma. And combined, I really lumped that together with the closed angle glaucoma because that means you have some aspects of the open and closed. And that's added up, that's about 40%. That's similar to Chinese. The about half, almost half of the glaucoma is this type where it's the closed angle type. And so Vietnamese are probably closer in terms of eye structure, at least, or, or risk for glaucoma as Chinese are. In Thailand, so what about the Thai? I'm going to kind of summarize this. Among their cases of open angle glaucoma, most of it was the normal tension type. So that seems to be a theme among a lot of Asian groups, that normal tension glaucoma is, is not uncommon. How about in the Malay population, Malaysian population from Singapore? Well, 85% of their open angle glaucoma was normal tension type. So again, in Asia, it's very, it's very different. A lot of closed angle glaucoma, a lot of normal tension glaucoma. So you know, kind of as a summary for all of that, you know, again, applying to all of you really at this point because we're talking about whites. The closed angle glaucoma as a percentage of all the glaucoma among whites is very small. That's what population studies have shown. <laughs> Whereas among Chinese, it's about a third of the glaucoma. And in fact, it's such a devastating form of glaucoma uh, that about 90% of the bi bilateral blindness, that means both eyes are blind, people are walking around blind, 
it's 90% of those cases. That's how devastating this is. I mean, even though it's not the most common form of glaucoma, it, it leads to blindness so much faster that, uh, that it counts for 90% of it in China. I'm going to end with a, sort of my last 10 minutes here, talking about, again, some of my research that I hope you'll find interesting as to explaining why Chinese seem to have this preponderance for closed angle glaucoma. And so remember that study where I said where we studied Chinese here, Chinese Americans, we studied whites as well, and we studied the Chinese in China. Well, we put all the Chinese together because their eye, eye structure parameters were all about the same. And we studied these things, which you don't have to try to understand. I'm going to show you pictures of what they mean. But these are parameters for the eye, you know, for the uh, anterior segment or the front part of the eye. We had a total of about 500 patients, Chinese Americans, white Americans, northern and southern Chinese. And again, I think the pictures will tell, tell a thousand words. So this is the front part of the eye. Remember that this is a, an actual scan of somebody's eye. And, and this is where the fluid goes out. This is the angle. Well, in Chinese, this depth, if you kind of adjust for everything else, age and how long the eye is and everything, Chinese have a shorter anterior chamber depth. That space in the front for the fluid to flow around is smaller. The anterior chamber width, this, this you know, distance from here to one side of the eye to the other is smaller. So in Chinese, they have a smaller, more crowded anterior segment. That kind of makes sense as to why, you know, fluid might be, not be able to get out. If you look at just the area, if you measure this white area here, the machine does it automatically for you, by the way, the uh, software. That's smaller in Chinese. If you look at the iris thickness, so this is a schematic of the angle here, is that that iris that I was telling you about in Chinese is thicker. People who are pigmented, of course, all Chinese have pigmented irises is that it's thicker. And in whites who probably have pigmented irises, let's say if you're Italian and you're, you have colored, you know, dark brown irises, you're probably closer to Chinese in terms of the thickness of your iris. If you're blue colored iris, you have a very thin iris. So why is this important? Because that iris makes up the wall of this angle, one of the walls. If it's thicker, you can imagine how it's that much closer to closing off. So in Chinese, it's thicker. And the change from going from you know, light to dark. When you go to the dark and the iris kind of crowds up into the angle, that's when angle closure happens. That was worse in Chinese. It, it, it clumps up more, it thickens up more in Chinese. So all of these factors are kind of risk factors for getting angle closure glaucoma. And when you actually measure the area of that angle, that recess, it's much smaller in Chinese. So I like to end this part of my talk by saying, gosh, when I was a kid growing up in the Bay Area, you know, and you go to school, well, gosh, you'd always get laughed at. You, you're the Chinese kid with the small, beady eyes. Well, lo and behold, they were right. I had small, beady eyes. <laughs> well, glaucoma, you know, I've, I've beat you over the head with this already. It's the main cause of irreversible blindness in the world. It's not insignificant. I mean, all of, that's why you're here. It was this rare disease. You wouldn't be sitting in here listening to me talk about it or be concerned that you might be getting it. Uh, among Asians, which this is sort of my specialty or my area of research interest, is it's very widespread, even among just the whole world, as I said, even among just the incidence of glaucoma, so much more in African Americans and, and Hispanics and, and Asians are somewhere in between. Vietnamese are closer to Chinese and having a lot of angle closure glaucoma. The Koreans and the Japanese are well known to have almost all normal pressure glaucoma, which really makes diagnosis and treatment hard. In fact, they often look for things outside of the box. So, th so for those of you who have glaucoma and you're wondering, gosh, my pressure is kind of low and I'm still getting worse or whatever, you know, I'm still getting worse no matter what happens, you know, what can else can I do? A lot of the research was done in Japan and Korea. They've looked at using systemic Beta, beta blockers or systemic calcium channel blockers as a way to maybe protect the nerve. The, the Koreans recently have put out a study look at ginkgo biloba. Well, what does that have to do with glaucoma? Well, ginkgo biloba, right, it's supposed to help your brain blood flow. So they're thinking of the more blood flow to your optic nerves, helping pre preserve that. So they have a study that seems to suggest it's helpful in that case. I'm not recommending that all of you go take ginkgo biloba, but I'm just saying that's, that's how severe it is in these countries where the pressure is not necessarily the problem, but that's the only thing we can treat. So they're thinking outside the box about what other things might be able to help stave off this disease. In Filipinos, it's such a mixture. They have some angle closure glaucoma. They have a lot of normal tension glaucoma. But, you know, the bottom line is, of course, you know, if you're over a certain age and, and uh, if you're a certain ethnicity, too, uh, you should get checked up for glaucoma. Thanks a lot, guys.
So they are, they're, they're different lasers in terms of their wavelength, and, but the patient experience may not be all that different. It's going to the doctor's office, it's no cutting, no bleeding, no infection, uh, and you see this machine come in front of you and you, you, you get some lens on your eye and you know, five minutes of lasering. So you may not notice the difference, but um, one of them is to make a hole in your iris. It again goes back to the plumbing thing, you know, trying to create a bypass. And the, the main risk for that is immediately, the doctor keeps you for an hour, is that because all that inflammation kind of gets expressed, uh, it can make your pressure go up. And so we've got to keep you an hour and check your eye pressure. So that's really the main medical risk. The one that is more long term that patients could get is that we create a little tiny microscopic hole, but we will get maybe like 2% of patients come back and say, oh, you know, sometimes I see a flash of light. I get scared. I, I don't know if I'm going blind or I'm getting a retinal detachment. And then when we examine their eye, the only thing is, is that, that they, the light, especially when they look up and exposes that hole and light goes through there is when they see that. So that's, I don't know if that's a complication. It doesn't make them go blind. It's just something that scares them a little bit. The other one uh, where I told you it was a very safe procedure for the open angle type of glaucoma, it's also medically number one sort of risk factor is that immediately after the laser, the inflammation can make the pressure go up in about 10, 15% of people. So we keep you for an hour and make sure everything's okay. And if everything is okay, it's practically side effect free. You know. Go ahead. Uh, if you're nearsighted, is that a less of a risk for glaucoma? No, actually, I didn't put it in here. Maybe I should have put that in here. I'm nearsighted, as I told you during the talk. I have these thick glasses, Coke bottle glasses. And uh, actually, um, it takes away, I was kind of telling you, it takes away the risk of having this closed angle glaucoma. So for me personally, I have practically zero chance of getting the closed angle glaucoma because my eyeball is so long, all that space for the yeah. fluid to get out. But no, it causes a different problem, is that when you're so near side, your eyeball is so long, it actually has damaged your optic nerve in a lot of patients. And those people are either suspects for glaucoma or a lot of them really will get glaucoma. So I'm starting to see a lot of those patients, especially among the Asian population, is that you know it's so common, it's almost an epidemic of nearsightedness in the young Asian population. And it's a higher risk factor. We published on that. So you know we've already published on that, that among people who get, as you get more nearsighted, and there's gradation. So I'm in the high category, unfortunately. And I'll, I'll, I'll reveal something very personal. When you do the scans of my nerves, like many of you probably have had, that easy test where they give you, again, a three-dimensional scan of your optic nerve, I'm outside normal limits. What does that mean? <laughs> they suspect glaucoma in me because my nerve is so twisted and so unusual looking, it looks glaucoma to us. And a lot of those people do have glaucoma, so it actually increases your risk for glaucoma. I think that's what we're going to see in the future in Asian populations, or at least in these urban populations where kids are supposed to study hard all the time and they get nearsighted. Yeah, go ahead. So we know that eye test, right? Periodic, annual, biannual, by an optometrist, is glaucoma? Well, that depends on the optometrist, to be honest with you. You know, I'm sure that there have been cases where, you know, I'm not criticizing, you know, a lot of optometrists are my friends, but maybe they just aren't <laughs> looking carefully enough. So it really depends on how well they're trained. And so, you know, I'm sure there have been cases where they've been kind of followed and they just kind of quickly look at you, your pre eye pressure is normal, so they're really not high suspicion. You keep going along for, for years and you, you really didn't know you had glaucoma. You know, the people who are, who are medically trained to, to check on this all the time and, and really know about all the tests, you know, are the ophthalmologists. Uh, but there aren't ophthalm enough ophthalmologists in the world, to be quite honest with you. That's the political ramifications. Yeah, you've had your hand up for a little bit. Oh, yes, yes. So, yeah, that, that was the uh, implication that I was saying is that the only thing we have to treat your glaucoma, whether it's normal pressure or high pressure, is to get your pressure lower. So, yes, the answer is that we treat it the same way. We have to get your eye pressure down, so we, we use eye drops in the beginning. If it's not enough and you're still getting worse, then we have to do surgery. It's much harder in that case in people with normal pressures because you're starting off with the normal pressure. And so we have to get your pressure super low, and that actually get, gets us close to causing damage to your eye. When it's too low, your eye doesn't like it too, and you don't see well when the pressure's too low. So those patients don't get eye drop, or they do? That's they do. That's the same thing. They first get eye drops as the treatment. I'm only talking about surgery if they need it, if the pressure's not low enough for them. And yeah. what, is the, what is the reason for glycoma if the pressure is normal? 
That's a great question. We don't know that either. Some of it may be genetic. There's a couple genes out there that have been linked to normal pressure glaucoma. And maybe it doesn't have to do so much with the pressure in these cases. Even when you get it low, or really low, it's still not good enough. We know that from studies. So a lot of people will still get worse. And so probably a lot of that is genetic. Maybe some of it is a little bit ra racially genetic as well. You know, maybe among the Japanese population, there's, there's a, uh, a tendency toward getting optic nerve damage even when the pressure is normal. But I guess I'm telling you, we don't know enough about the disease. If we did or we knew the genetics enough, we'd be getting genetic tests, you know, in people. We could, you, instead of saying you, you're just a suspect for glaucoma, we'll follow you, we could send you to the blood bank and, you know, get a test and we can tell you for sure if you have glaucoma or not. But we don't. We don't understand the disease enough. A lot of research has been done. A lot of genes have been found. But it's probably going to be like another decade before we have like a glaucoma test or something. Go ahead. Sure. I mean, there, there, there are a lot of medications that cause it, but I'm going to touch on just maybe the one or two that are, that are probably the most important. I mean, particularly steroids, because steroids are used to treat everything, right? I mean, if you have an autoimmune disease or if you have some rash on your skin, you're, you're slabbing on some steroid to make that rash go away, or you're taking it by mouth for, I, I mean, anywhere from rheumatoid arthritis to multiple sclerosis to, you know, all these autoimmune diseases that, uh, that we don't, but it, it quiets down the inflammation. But unfortunately, uh, a high percentage of us, you know, even if we don't have glaucoma or family history, will be steroid responders. And so there have been lots of cases, I'm sure, I know, I've seen some, that, that are ones that steroids were used or maybe directly in the eye for inflammation in the eye. And if you don't monitor the pressure, those people can get glaucoma and go blind. So that's probably the most common problem is uh, medication-wise is steroids is a cause of glaucoma and also cause of cataracts, by the way. We don't talk too much about that because at least we can take care of the cataracts, but it causes cataracts as well. So yeah, steroids are like a, a, a friend and an enemy at the same time. They have a lot of side effects. They can cause depression. They can cause uh, high blood pressure. They can cause diabetes if you're on them for long enough. Um, OK, there's a question there. That's, that's a really good question. In fact, there are more suspects than there are people with glaucoma. If you just look at a population study, I mean, a lot of population-based studies have been done. Usually 5,000 people, and they go through a population and say, let's examine you. So you're going to have more people in the bucket who are glaucoma suspects for what you just described, like their optic nerves look a little weird, and their, their pressures are OK, but they're technically a suspect. Or sometimes it's the other way around. Their pressures are a little bit high, but everything look, else looks OK, and so they're a suspect for just one of the reasons. So when do you treat them? Uh, this is what happens in reality. Glaucoma is defined by the fact that you get worse, okay? So that's sometimes why a doctor, you think they're incompetent, right? Oh, you're telling me I might have glaucoma, but you're not sure, you know, you can't t send me to a test. Well, they follow you over time and see if your visual field gets worse. That would be an indicator to treat you. They also do scans of your optic nerve. So what gets damaged? The, the disease is at the optic nerve. So if those scans show that you're getting worse the year or the next year or you know, over, there's a trend that you're getting worse, that's usually when you get treated. Uh, you know what? I better let some of the people go because we are 8.30 and you know, it's late at night. Uh, I'll stick around for a little bit.